Good afternoon and welcome to this, the November 13th edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. My name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy and I'm so happy to join you all today. It has been a minute. <laughs> no, it's been about a month since we posted Office Hours and much has transpired during that time. So we're going to um, answer the questions that have been submitted since our last episode and talk a bit about um, everything that's happened since mid-October of this year. So before I begin getting into questions, I always like to give you an overview of the center, tell you a little bit about us, and issue a quick disclaimer before getting into the questions that have come in from our community. So the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness was founded in 2021 with an ambitious vision and mission for all college and career school students in the state of Maryland. And that's that they'd be able to achieve these six pillars of collegiate financial wellness. Those are being credit worthy, ready, resilient, empowered, successful, and thriving. And I'm not going to read the fine print, but if you're interested in learning more about the center, you can visit us online at mccfw. Dot org, and you can learn more about those pillars as well as our programs and ways to support if you feel so inclined. All right. Now that you've learned a little bit about the center, I do want to uh, just give you a quick disclaimer about office hours. Office hours is our semi-monthly free student debt clinic where we answer questions from the community. However, office hours is presented for informational purposes only. The information that we present here today does not constitute personal, legal, or financial advice. Um, we do the best we can to keep up with all the changes that are happening in the student loan landscape, as well as the space of financial aid for college students. But in order to give you a truly holistic solution, we need to know more about your preferences, um, your loan portfolio, household characteristics, and all of that information is combined to come up with a strategy that uh, works best for you. So now that that's out of the way, uh, let's go on to just give some general updates before we get into questions. So we're still fielding lots of questions about SAVE and what the future of SAVE is, and um, not much has changed since the last time that uh, we hosted office hours. SAVE is still the subject of a lawsuit, and so uh, that lawsuit has resulted in an injunction that has basically blocked the future of SAVE for the time being. So we're going to be waiting probably a few months um, to find out if SAVE will be able to move forward. And in the meantime, we do know that a month spent during the SAVE forbearance right now, they're not set to count toward public service loan forgiveness or credits for forgiveness under an income driven repayment plan. And that presents a big challenge for people who are looking for a lower monthly payment while also staying on track for those forgiveness options. One of the questions that we have during today's episode is about um, changing repayment plans and if that's something you should do frequently. The short version of the answer is no, um, but for some people who are really close to the end of that journey toward public service loan forgiveness or uh, forgiveness by way of IDR, you might want to consider enrolling in income-based repayment, IBR, instead of SAVE, so that your progress continues. But that's something to evaluate, um, you know, at an individual level, depending on how close you are to forgiveness as of right now. All right. Um, any other updates? Yeah, we had an election. Um, we're just about uh, one week out from getting the results of that election. And another question that we get a lot is, how is this going to change? Are my student loans still going to be forgiven? You know, what's going to happen with those? And the answer is we have to wait and see. I can um, take this opportunity just to remind everyone that public service loan forgiveness uh, has been around since 2007. That was bipartisan legislation that was signed into law by then President George W. Bush. So um, public service loan forgiveness so far has been a program that has survived multiple administrations, Democrats and Republicans. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen next. So we will watch and um, we'll see what happens. But for right now, public service loan forgiveness is still around and um, I have no indication at this moment that it has disappeared or will. But like I said, we'll wait and see. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get to the first question for today. Question is about consolidation. It says, none of the payments prior to consolidation count toward my balance. I still have two separate undergrad loans with a higher payment count. 
I thought the point of consolidating before the deadline was to receive the higher payment count for both sets of loans. All right, this is a loaded question. We have a lot going on here. Uh, we have a payment count contributing to a balance. I think what that is, is they're looking at a payment count perhaps for PSLF. And after consolidation, it looks like that payment count has reset to zero. And this is common. But we had to ask um, you know, for more details before answering this question. So I do want to take a look at a background slide before we get to the answer. All right, so this is the person who met with Team McFew in June of 2024, and they completed both applications for consolidation and for public service loan forgiveness. Uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone who submitted applications around this time is mindful of the fact that the Department of Education put a processing pause on PSLF applications, and that pause was in effect for the months of May, June, and for half of July, so nothing was moving. Um, this was also before the federal injunction on SAVE, which prevented um, the second half of SAVE from being implemented and all of SAVE from really moving forward. Um, these loans are undergraduate and graduate school loans. The grad school loans were in an in-school deferment status, and the client planned to complete their program within 180 days of the consolidation application. This is important because after you apply to consolidate, you have up to 180 days to add additional loans to that consolidation loan. So this client opted to proceed with consolidating all of their loans, uh, probably because of the probably because of the IDR adjustment deadline that we were up against. Um, but they wanted to consolidate all loans and opt out of the grace period. Um, at the time that they submitted the question, they hadn't received any additional communication about the consolidation loan. Now let's go to the answer. We had a couple of follow-up questions. One was we wanted to know if this borrower had completed their program, because if they completed their program, there would be the opportunity to get those graduate school loans included, and they would enter repayment after the consolidation loan dispersed. Um, if you take loans from a program that you recently completed and combine them with older loans and you want that loan to go into repayment immediately so you can start earning credits for PSLF or even IDR forgiveness, that means that you're going to sacrifice some of your grace period on those graduate school loans. The grace period is usually six months. So had all of those loans been able to be wrapped up into the consolidation loan, then there would have been no grace period on those graduate school loans and all of that balance would have gone back into repayment. The other question was to find out if this borrower was still enrolled at least half time. And if they're enrolled half time, that means that those graduate loans or an in-school status or an in-school deferment. And unless they opt out of the, of the in-school deferment, we wouldn't have been able to get those loans into consolidation. Um, hopefully they would finish the program soon and then within 180 days, add those graduate school loans to the consolidation loan. So in this case, the consolidation loan is a new loan. And from the sound of it, this person has received a payment count for that consolidation loan. And given that they have older loans, that payment count should be greater than zero. However, this is something that we've observed since the limited waiver went into effect in um, 2021. After people consolidate their loans, um, the first payment count that they get shows the disbursement date of the consolidation loan, which is recent, and it also shows a payment count of zero. The payment count, um, sometimes we see them in the single digits, but the payment count is low because after loans are consolidated, the consolidation loan is a completely new loan. And that completely new loan has limited history. So the first payment count that you see only considers the brief history of that newly consolidated loan. So there's no need to be afraid if you see a payment count that's very low right after you completed a consolidation loan or right after your uh, consolidation loan has dispersed. This is common practice. Usually what happens is within about three to five weeks, that timeline can vary, but within three to five weeks, you see a new payment count that includes your pre-consolidation payment history. Keep in mind that this consolidation application was submitted during the IDR adjustment period. And throughout that entire period, this is what we've seen. After a consolidation loan is dispersed, the first payment count is usually in the range of zero to six. 
And then several weeks later, another payment count comes back that considers all of that repayment history and results in a much higher payment count. We do want to um, make sure that we take note of something that the Department of Education has said, and that's the consolidation and payment counts on consolidation loans are taking longer um, within a sea of other delayed processes. So it's really important that you keep in mind that, um, you know, the IDR adjustment that is something that's a one-time thing, the limited PSLF waiver was a one-time thing, uh, the processing cost from May to July hopefully is a one-time thing as well, but all of these things are happening at the same time. So it's important that you exercise patience and know that they're working toward rectifying all of this. It's just taking longer than usual because you have a lot of extraordinary events that have happened at the same time. So to this borrower, um, all in all, hang in there, check back in, probably around now because this question is from a few weeks ago, but check back at Mohila, not Mohila, I'm sorry, check back at studentaid.gov. That's where the payment counts now reside. Go to track your PSLF progress and let us know if that payment count has been updated. All right, let's move on to question number two. All right. Question is, do we get interest on the payments owed back to us? I am three payments past forgiveness. Are they legally required to pay us interest on that money? First things first, I want to say congratulations to this borrower because you have met and exceeded the requirements for public service loan forgiveness. So hopefully um, your discharge is in the works and that zero balance is coming for you soon. Now let's go to the answer. So uh, when it comes to refunds on PSLF, uh, refunds are possible, but refunds are only possible if you have made extra payments above and beyond the 120 qualifying payments, and those payments had to be made on direct loans only. So if you had direct loans the entire time, and like this person, you're now at three months past forgiveness, let's say you have 123 qualifying payments, if the three extra payments that you made were on that direct loan, then you should get a refund for that money. And that process is automatic. You don't have to um, submit a request to get that money back. However, if you had non-direct loans and you recently consolidated them and the payment count that you received of 123 is based on the history of those older non-direct loans, then you would not be entitled to a refund. So just please remember that although refunds are possible, it depends on the type of loan you had at the time the extra payment was made. For direct loans, the refund should come automatically. If it was a non-direct loan at the time the extra payments were made, then there would be no refunds. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you are entitled to a refund, I have to tell you, don't expect um, any like back interest from the government. There is no guidance that we have ever seen from the Department of Education that indicates that any excess um, interest or any interest that was accrued on your extra payments while the government had that money, there's no indication that that interest will be paid back or must be paid back to the borrower. So sorry about that. Congratulations on reaching forgiveness. We hope that that discharge gets processed soon, but there is no indication that interest on those overpaid um, on your overpayment will be refunded back to you by the government. Good question though. All right, let's move on to question number three. All right, it says, I saw an article on CNBC and I wanted to know how I qualify for Biden's forgiveness that was reported on October 17th of 2024. I know some time has passed, but you can probably expect to see another one of these announcements within the coming days because these announcements that usually come out roughly every month focus on, as of late, public service loan forgiveness because IDR forgiveness has been paused. So every month, there's usually an announcement from the White House that says, you know, however many billions of dollars in forgiveness were granted for X thousands of borrowers. This is about public service loan forgiveness and public service loan forgiveness is not new. So just to give a little bit of background on that before we get to the answer, let's take a look. It's this person uh, recently received Fresh Start, which was a program uh, that's no longer available, that, but that was a program for borrowers to get out of default as quickly as possible and get their loans on track for forgiveness by way of income-driven repayment 
and or public service loan forgiveness. Um, this person applied for PSLF in September of 2024. They have a combination of both FELP loans and direct loans. Now let's take a look at the answer. So the October 2000, um, excuse me, October 17, 2024 announcement again was indeed about public service loan forgiveness. And there was a huge deal made about this particular announcement because the Department of Education revealed that the number of approvals for public service, public service loan forgiveness had reached 1 million borrowers. That's a huge milestone. If you know any of the background um, on PSLF in the first years that um, people were truly eligible for it, uh, the program approved first estimates were around 16,000, but those uh, estimates have been revised downwards to about 7,000 people. So to go from 7,000 people three years ago to now more than 1 million people in October of 2024, that's definitely a big deal. And it was cause for the Biden-Harris administration to celebrate. Um, if you did not receive a notice, then it's unlikely that you're included in that round of PSLF approvals. And also, given that this person just submitted a PSLF application in September um, to be approved outright and get a congratulations letter one month later, would probably be record time, <laughs> timing that I have not seen. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've seen yet. But either way, if your employment qualifies, then your direct loans will be evaluated for PSLF. It might just take a little bit more time. And as a reminder, you can always check the status of your payment accounts by going to studentaid.gov and logging in. And after you get past all the two-step verifications and updating your contact information, on the quick links menu on the right side, you'll see a link that says track your PSLF progress. You can click there and then take a look at your eligible payments and qualifying payments for PSLF. So I hope uh, this person sees an update soon if they have not seen one already. All right, let's move on to question number four. All right, question is, I got a notification today of a payment schedule change. I've been on a forbearance for months and the amount due was $0 every month, but now I'm past due for four random loans. I'm confused as to if I should pay for this or dispute it. Um, let's go ahead to the answer. The first thing that I'd like to tell this borrower is you're not alone. We've heard from a lot of borrowers and we've also seen in some of um, you know online spaces where people have been chatting about this notification of a payment schedule change, even though they did not initiate the change. Um, this has been happening, especially to borrowers who are enrolled in SAVE. That is the income driven repayment plan that's currently tied up as a result of that federal injunction. So this has been happening for months, apparently. And the letter mentions that the loans are moving from SAVE to IDR. And the payment amounts that we're seeing in these notifications are significantly higher than what the borrowers were paying under SAVE or under any other income driven repayment plan. Just a quick note of um, this, this is about attention to detail. People have reported that the letters say that they're moving from SAVE to IDR. IDR is like a category of repayment plans. All of them are income driven. SAVE is a type of IDR plan. So when a letter says that your loans are moving from SAVE to IDR, I know that can be a little bit confusing because SAVE is an IDR plan, but you know, just semantics. Um, some borrowers have also seen payment amounts and due dates changing in recent weeks. This is actually something that I saw when I went online to make um, my most recent payment. I saw that the payment date had been pushed out another six days and the payment amount had changed. And then when I actually went to make the payment, the uh, page to make a payment was unavailable and I kept on getting an error message, tried several times. Um, and then checked in some of the community spaces and saw that people were experiencing the same error. So for this borrower, just know that we're in a time of um, not just uncertainty, but apparently things changing um, on the payment side, whether that's you know web platforms adjusting for the injunction or uh, I'm not sure, but things appear to be fluid. And sometimes that means that things are not accurate. So I'd encourage you to check again with your servicer, which is Mohila at mohila.studentaid.gov and make sure um, 
Well, check what repayment plan you're enrolled in and also check the amount that's due. Check the status to see if you've been placed back into a forbearance or the loans, if the loans are back in repayment. If the information that you're seeing for the payment is still inaccurate, I would reach out by phone call. Um, I would call Mohila first, or you can call federal student aid, but I would likely call Mohila first. If you cannot get a clear answer after you have inquired in good faith about this, I would encourage you to submit a complaint to the student loan ombudsman. You can submit to the um, ombudsman at the federal level if this inquiry rises to the level of their intervention. But if you're a Marylander, you can definitely file a complaint with the student loan ombudsman for the state. Um, this does appear to be something that's widespread, but that doesn't make it acceptable. And um, you are right in being concerned about damage to your credit. Um, I don't think the reporting would hit just yet. I know Fresh Start is over and the reporting is supposed to resume, but I think we saw a report last month that said that some of that reporting might not kick in until the new year. But either way, you want to make sure that your loans are in good standing and that's a responsible thing to do. So uh, keep checking. If you check online and see the inaccuracies, make sure you call, try to get a concrete answer. And if you're not pleased, make sure that you follow up with the student loan ombudsman to file a complaint and hopefully gain some clarity um, to your situation. All right, let's move on to question number five. All right, uh, question is, do payments under the standard plan count toward public service loan forgiveness or do you have to be on an income driven repayment plan for payments to count? Also, can you switch between payment plans at any point under normal circumstances? So let's take a look at the answer to this question. Um, when it comes to PSLF, it really depends on which standard plan you are enrolled in. There are two types of standard plans. There's one uh, standard plan, which is for people who have chosen the 10 year uh, repayment term. Then there's another standard plan for consolidation loans and that plan can take up to 30 years. So if you're in the 10 year standard plan, those payments would count toward PSLF. If you were in the 30 year standard plan, those payments would not count toward PSLF. Now there has been some wiggle room there because of the limited PSLF waiver, as well as the IDR adjustment. And during those periods, payments made on either one of those standard plans could count toward PSLF, but we are out of that IDR adjustment period. Um, that most recent deadline was June 30th of this year. So after that point, you would need to be enrolled in a qualifying plan for PSLF in order to keep on earning credit. The plans that qualify for PSLF are the 10-year standard plan, as I mentioned before, as well as all of the income-driven repayment plans. As to whether you should switch repayment plans, you can switch repayment plans. You can go from a fixed plan to an income-driven plan. You can go from an income-driven plan to a fixed one. But it's not a good idea to change re uh, repayment plans frequently. Um, for one, if you want to make sure that you stay on track for PSLF, you're trying to minimize unnecessary pauses. And sometimes when you change repayment plans, especially in this time of you know, uncertainty with injunctions and whatnot, it's possible that your loans could be placed into a forbearance that does not count toward public service loan forgiveness. Um, it's also possible that you might choose a plan that doesn't qualify for PSLF and then lose credit. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness is still an option, but it's more difficult to get approval for that as opposed to PSLF under those waiver and IDR adjustment conditions. So if you need to switch repayment plans, you know, no worries, you can do that. But this is not something that you should just kind of do on a whim. Really think about this. Um, consider how it could alter your path toward public service loan forgiveness. And after you've considered all of those things, then go ahead and make your final decision about whether you'd like to switch. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, this question is from a graduating law student. It says, I'm graduating law school soon. Should I pursue public service loan forgiveness as a public defender or should I pay off these loans? Um, is one option more financially intelligent than the other? This is a great question. Um, it does require more context though. So <laughs> we're gonna take a look at the background of this borrower's situation. 
um, before we provide the answers to the question. All right, so this particular borrower is graduating from law school, has approximately $90,000 in debt. And this is um, relatively low for what we usually see for law school graduates. They are um, taking a job as a public defender with a pre-tax salary of $85,000. And that salary is expected to rise for each year that they remain employed as a public defender. Um, this person is also the first in their family to get a law degree and have this type of debt. Um, you're feeling a little bit stuck on which option is best for paying off the debt. They have already confirmed um, that their employment will qualify because they're a public defender. But since their loan debt is relatively low, they're considering just taking all of their disposable income and putting it toward the loans for the next three to four years to pay the debt off faster. Um, I do want to come back to low. When um, you hear someone say, you know, their debt is low, just remember everything is relative. Low to you might not be low to another person and vice versa. In this case, they've said their debt is relatively low because for law school graduates, um, in many cases, the debt is six figures or higher. So relative to other, you know, law graduates, they have a low amount of debt. And uh, for that level of debt, they also have um, income, which is somewhat close to the level of debt. So let's take all of that context and keep it in mind as we answer the question. So one thing I want to um, just make sure that this borrower knows is that your preference is an important part of choosing your strategy. You're the one who has to pay the bill each month. You're the one who has to file the application for public service loan forgiveness if you choose to. This is all driven by you. So the right answer for what to do is up to you. There are some people who would say, you know, attack the debt aggressively, get rid of it as soon as possible. And that's great for them, but you have to do what's best for you. And that's where a personalized strategy comes into play. If you can afford to repay the debt faster and you want to repay the debt faster, then I would encourage you to repay the debt faster. Um, however, if repaying the debt faster would sacrifice um, a lot of your own wellness, then I would encourage you to maybe slow it down. But again, um, at the core of this is your preference and um, what you want for your repayment story because you are the author of that. So my recommendation to you is to keep your options open. The first thing I would do is to get on track for PSLF so that you can um, you know, start to accumulate credit and just keep that option open as you continue to do your work as a public defender. So to get on track and stay on track for PSLF, you would need to apply for PSLF by completing the application um, once you begin working and also make sure that you're enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan and all of the income driven repayment plans qualify toward PSLF. It's important to note that you would not start, start earning credit toward PSLF until your first month of the loans being in repayment while you were working as a public defender. You have to have the repayment history and the work history at the same time. So get on track by enrolling in an income driven repayment plan and submitting that first PSLF application once you begin working. The second recommendation is to, of course, keep the loans in good standing because with PSLF, um, you definitely have to make sure that you make the payments on time and in full each month. But for your own personal credit, uh, you want to make sure that you keep the loans in good standing so that it doesn't cause your credit history and credit score to suffer, which can make the rest of life more expensive if you have to finance a purchase or um, rent an apartment or something like that. So make sure you keep the loans in good standing. But again, I cannot understate the importance of you being the person that makes this decision. Um, and also, once you make the decision about which you'd like to pursue, you can always come back and change your mind. That's why our approach to this is keep your options open. You could decide that you want to aggressively repay this debt and in a couple of years, your situation changes. That could be another dependent, um, a more expensive place where you're living. There's so many things in life that could happen over time that affect that, that strategy. 
So do not be afraid to revisit the plan and adjust the plan where necessary, but we believe it best to keep your options open. So best wishes for much success in your career, as well as um, on that road to zero. All right, let's take a look at question number seven. Okay, this is shifting gears a bit. We're moving toward the FAFSA. It says, I'm trying to renew my FAFSA and in years past, I could just import my tax information from the IRS. This year though, I don't seem to have that option. I can manually upload a return, but not automatically. Did they do away with that tool? So let's go to uh, the answer. All right, so the IRS data retrieval tool was replaced with something called the IRS Direct um, Data Exchange. It's another tool that's used in the FAFSA. It allows students and their contributors to pull federal tax information, and you have to consent for that information to be pull, pulled. So the answer is it didn't go away. Um, the, the ability to transfer information didn't go away. It just changed. So now it's a, the direct data exchange instead of the data retrieval tool. So hopefully um, you will consent and then be able to go through with that process. All right, next question. All right, this is a student or, a, um, yes, a student, excuse me, who's in their early 20s planning for graduate school and they want to know, can they submit the FAFSA application um, on their own? Or it says, well, I have to add my parents' tax return as a dependent student. Um, we're going to share some background on this question first, but one point uh, I want to um, emphasize is around the use of the word dependent. When we hear dependent in terms of um, tax purposes and dependent um, in terms of whether you're a dependent or independent student for college and career school purposes, those words have different meanings. So it's important to recognize that just because you are a dependent on your parents' taxes, it does not mean that you are a dependent student for the purposes of securing financial aid. So let's get some more background um, and then provide an answer to this question. All right, so this person worked part-time last year and full-time this year, and they filed a tax return last year. Uh, they have been claimed as a dependent by their parents, and they're also getting health insurance through their parents. Now let's move to the answer. Um, a parent claiming you as a dependent does not mean that you are a dependent student for the purposes of seeking federal financial aid. In fact, if you are applying to a graduate school program, just by virtue of being a graduate school student, that makes you independent. So that's automatic. As a graduate student, your dependency status is independent for the purposes of pursuing financial aid. Uh, as a graduate student, you're eligible for federal unsubsidized loans. You might see these listed as direct unsubsidized loans or web on the website. And you could also apply for um, plus loans, direct plus loans for graduate professional students. On the FAFSA, you'll need to make sure that you answer um, questions in section four, which is student college or career school plans. Um, you want to make sure that you are answering when the student begins the 2024-25 school year will they already have their uh, first bachelor's degree and also what when the student begins the 2024-25 school year what will their college grade level be this has to do with that transition from undergraduate school to graduate school and just as a reminder financial aid is different for undergraduate students versus graduate school students the FAFSA still has to be completed, regardless of what kind of program you're pursuing, if you want to be considered for federal financial aid. However, the options that are available to graduate students differ from the options that are available to undergraduate students. One question that we get um, quite often is about Pell Grants for graduate school students. Pell, Pell Grants, excuse me, are for undergraduate students. So if you're completing the FAFSA for a graduate program, you should not expect to see a Pell Grant when you do receive your financial aid offer from um, your higher education institution of choice. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, uh, I moved to the US in April of 2024 and I'm currently enrolled in a community college. I applied for the FAFSA and got an email from my college saying that I haven't made a payment for the fall 2024 term. 
Should I contact the FAFSA department to ask about the processing? Quick note on this question. It says, should I contact the FAFSA department? Um, the FAFSA is a form and the financial aid department or the financial aid office at your school will be responsible for answering your questions about the FAFSA. The FAFSA comes from federal student aid, which is a part of the Department of Education. So I just wanted to um, clarify that there because sometimes people might think they need to call FSA, which is federal student aid. And some people want to know if they should call the financial aid office, which is on their campus. So two different things. When you use the term uh, FAFSA department, sometimes people might not know exactly which one you're referring to. So let's take a look um, at the answer. All right, so a couple of questions first. One, did you receive a FAFSA confirmation? And second, is your community college requesting additional information to offer your financial aid? If you um, need to provide additional information to the school and you have not done so yet, you will not see a financial aid offer. So we definitely recommend that you connect with the campus financial aid office because they're going to be the ones that are responsible for processing um, that aid. So this is doesn't seem to be an FSA question. This seems to be a question for the campus financial aid office. All right, let's move on to the next question. Oops, I'm sorry, left out a part of that answer. <laughs> uh, the question is your financial aid office, um, if they have to make any changes to your FAFSA, that should lead to an official student aid index. And the student aid index is something that they need in order to make you a financial aid offer. So um, if you've had changes that are made to the FAFSA, the financial aid office should let you know after those changes have come back as accepted from the Department of Education. And again, that's something that you would contact the Office of Financial Aid for to find out about that timeline. And I need to apologize quickly. I think that I skipped over one of the, um, the question slides here. And this was one about a person who needed changes on their FAFSA. But it is also possible that the person with the previous question might have some changes to make too. And if those changes have not been accepted, then that is something that could delay you receiving a, a federal financial aid offer and funding to pay for that term bill. All right, now let's move on to the next question. Okay. It says, I completed my FAFSA for the first time with one of my colleges of interest. The others are saying that I can't complete the FAFSA until later. Is there more than FAFSA now? Or is there more than one FAFSA now, I think is what they meant to say. And the answer is no, there is just one FAFSA. Um, if you were able to complete the FAFSA one time, I would think that you'd be able to complete it and send it to other schools, but let's check and see the answer for a bit more detail. All right, so great question. Um, with the FAFSA, there's a FAFSA every year. So there's a 2024-25 FAFSA, and then there's a 2025-26 FAFSA. The 2526 FAFSA is currently available for a very small set of schools. Right now, they're uh, undergoing beta testing, launched, and that was launched on October 1st. But the FAFSA is not going to be widely available until December 1st. Um, so if you encountered a school that's participating in this round of beta testing, then perhaps that's why you were able to submit the FAFSA for them. Keep in mind that the vast majority of schools are not included in this beta testing period. Um, the Department of Education has announced that beta phases one and two are going well, and they're continuing to work toward a full launch for all students on December the 1st. So hang in there. Um, if you were able to participate during that beta test experience, good for you because you got a head start you know, on seeing things. But the FAFSA will not become widely available until um, I believe the language said by December 1st. So we'll see it soon. That's just a little bit more than two weeks away. And by then you should be able to add the other um, colleges of interest so that they can receive your financial aid information as well. All right, I think that does it for the questions. I wanna take a look um, just to see if we've got any um, questions on Instagram. I do wanna say hello to Chop Suey. 
122269. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, let us know. All right. So I want to close out the episode just by uh, sharing with you a resource that's especially for student loan borrowers in the state of Maryland, and that is the Office of the Student Loan Ombudsman. The Department of Education has an ombudsman's office, um, but some states also have a student loan ombudsman who's dedicated to providing residents with assistance regarding their student loans. Um, the student loan ombudsman for the state of Maryland can help with a variety of problems, and we've been referring to pe people to them a lot as of late. Um, the service or problems that they can assist with include failure by the servicer to communicate with the borrower, errors in crediting principal and interest payments, misapplied payments, inaccurate interest rate calculations, billing errors, loan consolidations or modifications errors, and or inappropriate collections activities or tactics. So if you've had any of these problems with your servicer and you have reached out to them and you have tried to um, get the issue resolved and you are not seeing any traction or resolution, I would encourage you to go ahead and escalate. Um, you can look at the Department of Education Student Loan Ombudsman website to find out if your concern rises to the level of their intervention, or um, you can reach out to the state's Student Loan Ombudsman. Um, it could be that you reach out to both just to send a message that you definitely want to see things resolved. Uh, but the important thing is that you remember you have options for advocating for yourself, whether it's the federal level or the state level. If you're experiencing a long-standing customer service issue and you have really in good faith tried to work this out with the servicer to no avail, please do take advantage of these opportunities to engage a third party that is um, interested in helping you get resolution. Okay, so check out the Maryland Student Loan Ombudsman online through the state's Department of Labor and the link is scrolling at the bottom of this slide. All right, at this time, I would like to thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. Um, my name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy. I'm the founder and executive director of the center. And as always, we really appreciate your engagement. Um, I just wanted to share that we had a long break from last office hours to this edition of office hours because I was dealing with an issue uh, with my voice, which seems to be resolved. So happy to be back and um, taking your questions. We appreciate your patience as well as your continued engagement. Uh, one thing that I would like to say before we close out has to do with the season that we're in, and that is one that is uh, immediately following a general election. There are a lot of people who have reached out who are anxious. They're wondering, you know, what's going to happen with their student loans? Are their payments going to increase? Is forgiveness going to go away? And I completely understand um, as a borrower, but also as a human, how um, uncertainty around your finances can fuel anxiety. And um, anxiety, of course, is counter to wellness. And wellness is something that we strive for and something that we want to help you achieve. So I would just tell you to um, try hard not to worry. Control what you can. We will wait and see what happens. And when we get more information about what will happen, we will you know, go through it all and make sure to, to bring it to you um, in terms that are um, more understandable than the terms that these announcements are sometimes published in. <laughs> so just uh, rest assured, we're keeping an eye on things. And as soon as there is something significant and concrete for us to share, we will do that. In the meantime, I just wanted to um, let you all know that even if we're not posting something every day in response to every you know, announcement that mentions student loans or some of these articles that might have um, titles that can be a little bit alarming, uh, just make sure that you are kind of filtering what you take in and um, kind of approaching the intake of news with a, a lens of what's news, what's noise. News is something that is meaningful. News is something that is actionable. Whereas noise um, is something that, um, you know, there's uncertainty even in the noise. There are oftentimes you'll find um, in the titles, you'll see this might happen, you know, after the election or what could happen. Yes, it's true that some of these things could happen or might happen, but they haven't happened yet. 
So that means that you don't need to take any immediate strategic moves in response to things that have not happened yet. Stay educated, get your list of solid sources so that you can be prepared. But um, generally speaking, panic is not the thing to do right now. So please do your best, control what you can, try to stay calm and know that we are watching just like you are. And once there's something significant to share, we will most certainly share as we always do. All right, I'm going to check one more time to see if we have any comments or questions on our socials. Uh, I don't see any. So if you do have any comments or questions, please do feel, reach, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We are on socials at BMCCFW. Um, you can also submit questions through our website at mccfw.org. And um, we're quite busy this fall. So if you want to know what's going on with McFew, you can follow us on social media, but also look at our program and event calendar um, for the coming months. Um, the next edition of Office Hours will be in two weeks, right before the Thanksgiving holiday. So we're looking forward to being back here on November the 27th at noon for the next edition of Office Hours. And if we have no questions, hopefully that means I got them all. Um, if we have no questions, I thank you again for joining us and I will see you next time on Office Hours presented by the Center, the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. I do have to say this before I go. Um, I have been a little tongue tied as of late. I'm out of practice. It's been a month away. <laughs> so forgive me for any jitters on this return uh, to office hours. But again, thank you so much for joining us for your support and your engagement. And as always, until next time, be well.